I'd like to call the uh, meeting in Chetwin District to order. Uh, opening statement will be read. As we begin our meeting this evening, we reflect on the service we provide to our citizens and we will endeavor to conduct our business effectively and productively on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody see anything that they need to add to our agenda for new business before adoption? Seeing none, adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Good. Second. All those in favor of the agenda? Carry okay. Okay, we'll go to the minutes of uh, January 13th, 2020. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, let's get down to business. Uh, welcome to Chatwin, uh, Jennifer. I think you're up, uh, our first delegation. Oh, you're second, sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> we would uh, like to welcome the Chainsaw Carving Committee. Or the society, I, uh, my mistake, you betcha. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Larson. I'm the president of the Chetwin International Chainsaw Carving Society, Championship Society. I'm happy to finally be here reporting to the District and Council on the past year's successes and the coming year's projections and plans to make this annual event the amazing community collaboration that it has become. The 2020 competition will mark the fourth year that the Society has run this event and the 16th year of the competition as a whole. The Board of Directors would like to give a heartfelt thank to all the sponsors and volunteers that have made our job so easy over the years. The current list of directors and contact information is available if uh, anybody would like. I have a couple copies of it here. And we encourage everyone and anyone who would like to assist with the society or the event to please reach out and we'll find a way to get you involved. Last year's event was another resounding success. We were able to improve in every aspect of what we as a society aim to achieve. Most notably, we were able to send each of our 12 carvers home safe and sound with more money in their collective pockets than ever before. We accomplished this by raising our appearance fee per carver to, in essence, give them just a little bit more money to cover their travel costs because we do have carvers coming from all around the world to come here to Chetwin to carve with us. And we also had our highest ever grossing quick carve auction last year. As a town, we gained 12 more world-class sculptures. We also had great success in our fundraising efforts by the Society last year, and we were able to add around $10,000 to the event through our various raffles, retail sales, vendor fees, donations, and our dedication to being fiscally responsible as a society. For this coming year, we will be investing in some of that capital that we have raised into, into capital asset upgrades. This year we'll see the Society invest in two customized retail tents, 10 by 10 little uh, tents that with the, you know, the Society branding on them and, and, and things like that for uh, where we sell our retail events down at the site, as well as where we put our chainsaw mechanics and stuff inside the site, as well as investing in a, and creating a portable tool crib and a variety of tools to help line the shelves of that tool crib. I don't know if you realize or not, but the, uh, the society already owns uh, quite a bit of uh, tools uh, over the years as it was the Chamber of Commerce. They invested a bunch of money and we have a certain tool inventory that we upkeep and this year we'll be adding a few saws and, and a few uh, needed items to that. As always, uh, fiscal responsibility and community involvement will be at the forefront of all the decisions made by the board. We have involved many of our local businesses and sponsors in planning for these purchases. We are super excited to see how these investments and partnerships will elevate the competition to another level of professionalism on the world stage that we have found ourselves on. Chapman has created an event that reaches all corners of the world and continues to grow each year. Our success has been emulated by many other competitions, but never quite duplicated or matched. The 2020 event will be no exception. 
with possibly the best lineup of carvers we have ever seen. 12 carvers comprised of four Canadian, four US, and four international artists will blow us away again this year with all their best efforts. There are many reasons the carvers come to Chetwin and to prove themselves. We offer them freedom of artistic expression to a certain extent when it comes to anything too nasty, there is, there is rules. <laughs> Difficult and varied competition amongst their peers and the highest quality of wood that we can find and their work on display alongside with some of the world's best chainsaw carvers of the past. The overwhelming hospitality and sense of community that surrounds this weekend does not go unnoticed by them either. Over the past seven, now eight years that I have volunteered with the event, the one recurring, recurring praise that I hear coming back from our carvers is how well they are all taken care of. Our social media presence has begun to explode with some of our more recent posts reaching up to 50,000 views and shares. We can be found on Facebook, Instagram, as well as a website that we developed last year that is also beginning to gain, gain traction. The 2019 competition could not have been the success it was without the partnership that we share with the District of Chetwin. This is more than just a sponsor, you guys. You guys are a partner with us because uh, with the sponsorship, there's a certain sponsorship that we use to uh, buy the wood with and stuff like that that, that comes from the district, but the partnership comes when we uh, when we put the event on. And it's all the, uh, all the different uh, facets of the district and council that help put that together. As far as uh, placing the logs, the bleachers, the picnic tables, the garbage cans, uh, the rec center staff is uh, always, you know, uh, very helpful during this weekend. Last year they provide a PA system. They always provide our uh, first aid support as well as part of our emergency plan is that uh, the, the rec center has the highest level of uh, first aid attendant at their, at their business. So uh, that's part of our emergency plan when we phone over to there first, phone the ambulance. We always have a, a clear spot for the ambulance to come in. So please pass our thanks on to your respective departments, you know, Ellen especially, you know, pass that on to your uh, respective departments. They rocked it this year. I uh, look forward to much the same of a great partnership this year. Thank you. The 2020 planning is well underway and we have confirmed all 12 carvers and two of our three judges. 75% of our wood is already set aside and ready to, and nearly ready for shipping. The tool crib, the retail products, and are all set to be ready for competition weekend as well as trade show weekend. Sponsorship letters and requests have been going out and vendors have signed up early and often. I believe we currently have eight of our 12 carver, carvers already sponsored and we all look forward to another successful years of ama amazing sculptures and great partnerships and goodwill. Uh, thank you, and I do have, if anybody would like, I have a breakdown of the budgets for our capital expenditures that we plan on doing this year. That's the uh, CCAN and the tool upgrades and the customized uh, tents. I also have our list of carvers here, and I also have our list of, uh, of our board members this year. So if there's any questions, I'm also totally free for that right now. I have a couple of our board members here with us, so anything that I might not be able to answer, we're, we're definitely uh, there for that. So is there any questions? I do have a question. Thanks, Chris, for that. That was great. Um, one of the questions is, you're fundraising by society members. Can you give me examples of what you guys did to raise that money? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, so with our uh, retail is a big one for us like so we have like about a 20% markup on our retail and stuff and we sell you know pro a few thousand dollars worth of retail every year our raffles that we've done in the past we oh, get a okay. we get a gaming license and uh, and uh, we've raffled off carvings and uh, we had I know you know a couple quilts along the way stuff like that so those raffles those are another couple thousand dollars by the time we were done last year it was it was really exceptional uh, we've put on a couple different events along the way there we did a steak night one year that was that was really well received we did a Halloween dance it was you know it was a break-even type thing but it was still you know it's yeah. still just the but that's the type of things that the society is doing as our volunteer board to try and help it out and that's the money that we use to try and grow the society itself like the uh, tool inventory and stuff like we don't we don't go out and uh, try and hit up our sponsors for that money. The, the sponsor money goes directly 
to the actual thing that they're sponsoring. So if they're sponsoring the welcome dinner or the carver or anything like that, all that money stays to them. And then we take this money that we try and raise and we try and improve the event every year. Perfect, thank yeah. you. I did have a uh, couple concerns that were brought forward uh, there, just uh, some thoughts and stuff that were, uh, you know, that I could alleviate there if anybody has a little time. As uh, there, there was a question about, do we have a safety officer or first aid attendant visible on site? Uh, and as I mentioned there, the rec center is part of our emergency response plan as well as because they do have a high level of uh, first aid attendant always on, on hand. But uh, we agreed that, yeah, maybe we do want to have a better presence in that. We do have a level one first aid kit uh, in, our, in our tool crib with us and stuff like that. This year it's going to be set up a lot better with that, with that uh, portable tool crib. We're going to have an office space in the front that can be used as a first aid area and then a tool area in the back all sealed separately. So, and we do have a level one first aid kit there with us. I, I don't have a level one first aid. I have a first, I have a, I have first aid myself, but, uh, but uh, so yeah, maybe that is a concern that we can look at going forward for sure. Uh, you know, there was a couple other things like garbage cans at every site. Well, you know, as, as far as that goes, we have, a, we have a specific crew set up that cleans every year. We, we, uh, we, we, we pay out for that. We have a, a set of cleaners that comes in and we do better at that than any other competition in the world at this point. So, you know, like uh, there's, there's some things in there that are, that are definitely, uh, definitely worth looking at. I, I think the uh, one that I noticed was uh, definitely worth taking into note was uh, the height, the, the height this year, this last year in 2019, we had somebody build the tallest carving we've ever had. And it became an issue when we went to move it. And it was like, it, they were just about, like it was just under the wires and stuff. So, so, you know, with that in mind, yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna talk to Ben, I'm gonna talk to Blaine. We're gonna say, you know, what is the maximum height we can do? And our carvers will know that this year. They'll know that going forward. Uh, but yeah, so if there's a, hey, what happened there? All right, if there's any other, any other questions, I'm, yeah, like I say, I got, uh, I got a few board members here. If there's anything we can Counselors, help you with or. Any more questions? Yeah, I had one on, uh, I guess on uh, the painting, some of the citizens were worried about the painting and uh, old school people say wood should be wood. If it's a wood carving, we should see the wood. So, yeah. you know, you could get a bust and uh, paint it and say that, well, you know, we, I'll be, I'd, I'd be one of those people when I got asked that question, I was in agreement that if we're painting something, do we paint it? Uh, as a bust, or do we paint it as a wood carving, or do we paint it as a yeah, you know, sculpture absolutely. from I bronze? Hear you, I hear where you're coming from, right. and that's that's one of those things where when uh, so uh, you, like understandably we have the world's best chainsaw carvers coming to us, right? Some of those guys, their specialty is maybe speed carving. Some of them, uh, you know, maybe a lot of them do a lot of airbrushing and stuff. But basically, within our within our parameters of what we give them. We allow them to do that if they have time in that 35 hours. Now, if they do, you know, a half job of it, like look at uh, a good example would be the Spider-Man from last year. You know, without the color, it wouldn't be the same carving. And that's artistic impression. And, it, and part of the big part of these carvers coming here and stuff is their ability to really express themselves. A lot of, a lot of competitions like this one that are similar to this one, are, uh, they, they have a, a theme every year or, or something like that where they're, where they're told kind of what parameters to stay within. So when it comes to that, it's, it's hard to, I'm gonna, you know, carvers are, are a hard group to, to get into one thing. They're all artists and we like to allow them to express themselves as much as possible. Yep. Yeah, I just like to stress that it's a wood carving, not a painting of Rembrandt's, right? <laughs> we, we have some pretty good carvings that are, aren't, that don't have paint on them. So, you know, it's, it was something that uh, people and myself think about, you know. It's, it, a, it's a valid it's, point yes, for sure and, like, and how, something how far worth discussion. Should we but. paint the whole thing? Should we just paint some of it? You know, some use uh, 
they burn it, right? So make yeah. It different colors. Oh, so those, and 90% you know, of them yeah. burn it somehow, yep. some way, yep. and get so that color going is that a different way. different form of And again, of art, then right? the verithane changes the colors too and stuff. So yep. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's an opinion piece, really, that mm -hmm. one. It's, it's hard to, hard to nail down one way or the other, I believe. But, uh, yeah, Chris, I'd uh, just like to say good job. I mean, that's a few questions. You guys, you know, rock in everything that you guys do out there, and uh, it's quite valuable to Chatwin as uh, I hear it when I go out to uh, uh, conferences, to forums, anything. This is what we bring, and this is one of the best things that we have here. Chatwin is uh, chainsaw carvings, and uh, to for me to go out there and tell them, oh yes, I don't have to talk very much. I says go to our website, you'll see every one of them. And it's very, 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 it makes me very proud to be from Chatwin when, when I do talk about the chainsaw carvings. It really and is. And as thing. a partner from, uh, from the district, I mean, you, you can't ask for a better partner like us. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but thank you very much for that, Chris. And if there's any more questions, uh, we'll let Chris. Okay, thank you very much once again. You betcha, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks for the, the society. Thank you. Jennifer. Jennifer Badley from? Well, I'm not supposed to be affiliated with the Peace River Re Re Regional nope. District, so uh, <laughs> yes. UNBC students? Yes, Peace River Regional is good. Hmm. Yeah, I talked to uh, talked to the directors up there, and we're fine with it. All right, so hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Um, well, I do work for the Regional District, but this is not at all affiliated with the Regional District. Um, I was attending UNBC probably for the last 10 years prior to coming up this way. And in the end of it, I wrote a undergrad thesis for the last two years on electric vehicles in Northern British Columbia, um, specifically identifying the barriers to my, like expansion of electric vehicles throughout the North and then also detailing who should be responsible for solving those. Um, Today, though, I'm going to be speaking on my thesis, leaving the who should be responsible part out. That needs to get revised again. Um, and then I'm also going to give a very brief update on um, some potential fleet vehicle options that are coming out, actually, in the next couple of years. So, yeah. Um, also, just a note, too. Um, I'm going to keep the presentation a little bit short because I really want to hear your questions for obviously more research uh, purposes and potential. So, um, all right. Okay, so jumping into it. Um, the, so there's three types of electric vehicles most commonly found in British Columbia. Um, there is obviously more out there, but these are the three that for the most part you'll find. Um, they're the regular battery electric vehicles, uh, your plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and your extended range vehicles. Um, your battery electric vehicles and your extended range, though, are going to be the most environmentally sound uh, in the sense that they actually use electricity to propel your vehicle forward, whereas your plug-in hybrid vehicle actually uses gasoline to then power the engine then to move it forward. So not as great. Um, let's see, okay, so all of you have this sheet in front of you, hopefully. Um, and that is, it gets updated every couple of months, at least once a year though, um, showing all the different electric vehicles that are actually found in British, oh. Deanne, do we have enough for the public? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Jennifer. Oh. 
Um, so yeah, it gets released by Plugin BC, which is kind of an informational slash promotional um, organization or nonprofit organization that deals with electric vehicles. Um, and this sheet that you have in front of you will show the different types that are in the province as of June 2019. Um, and it'll show the range that they're typically at, the type of uh, electric vehicle they are, proximate cost, um, but on the lower end of cost. Um, yeah. And so, just to give you a little bit of information of uh, vehicles that are, or trucks at least, that are being brought into um, DEET in the next couple of years. Uh, the first one that we have here, and there are many more coming out, these just are the ones that are a little bit more prevalent, it seems. Um, so Ford is bringing out an electric Ford F-150. Sometime in 2021, they haven't released any specs yet though, so I don't quite know how much this thing can do, but apparently it towed a train at one point with like a hundred other trucks inside the train, so decent, I guess. <laughs> and then um, there's an American startup company called Rivian. Uh, that's releasing the Rivian R1T sometime later this year. Uh, it apparently can tow up to 11,000 pounds and has a range up to 640 kilometers that's pure electric. Um, and then the last one that I have here at least is the Lordstown Endurance. Um, they bought out the General Motors plantation in Ohio. Um, this truck that they have bringing forward is intended for strictly fleet use, but they are doing a little bit of personal orders, I guess, too. Should be released in 2021, um, but no specs have been released on it either yet, unfortunately. Now, they're great options. Problem is, is I don't know if they're actually gonna show up in British Columbia or not, because that's one of our barriers, is apparently Canada doesn't bring in electric vehicles that often. Um, I have a bunch of pros and cons you'll see on the slide. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail because that will take hours and apparently I have 10 minutes. So, um, but I will be making a shorter version of my 60 page thesis available to you all here in a few months once it's actually finished and revamped. Um, that does go into this way more in depth as well. So. Let's see. Okay, so charging stations. Um, there's four types out there. There's level one and level two. I think Chetwin has a level two AC or yeah, AC charger. Um, alternating current, sorry, not the fast charger. Um, so your level one charger is your typical 120 volt plug-in, basically anything that you have in this room right now you could charge with. Um, but it will take you anywhere between four and 20 hours to charge your vehicle from empty, depending on your battery. Uh, your level two AC charger or alternating current charger is about 240 volts. And it takes about five hours to charge. That's gonna be the most prevalent one that you actually see throughout the province, um, specifically in the north, less or more DC chargers in the south. Um, your level one and level two DC chargers or direct current chargers, those are the ones that you hear that charge up to like 30 to 40 minutes. A um, Little bit of a myth, they only charge up to 80% of your battery and then you have to top up with a different charger, otherwise you'll be sitting there for a lot longer. Um, so. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind too with these charging stations is that not all electric vehicles uh, can actually plug into uh, all types of charging stations. Um, most hybrids can't actually plug into direct chargers, for instance, or level threes or fast chargers. Um, but we're working on that. <laughs> so, oh, that's super small. Um, okay, so this 
map here. Um, it's a little bit small, but you're going to see red triangles scattered throughout the top of it. Um, this is kind of showing the rough northeastern area um, of British Columbia with uh, just also a, an idea of what's kind of in Prince George. Um, so each red triangle is at least one charging station. Um, and this is based off of three different types of maps. So depending on which map you go to at which time, it doesn't always show all of the charging stations. So that's also a bit of a barrier that we're working on too. Um, but you will find at least a few in Prince George. And then it looks like there's some in Grand Prairie. There's one here, uh, Dawson Creek has a couple. And then randomly there's a bunch up far north as well as you can see, so. All right, so I'm just gonna jump to the point here. Uh, my recommendation to Chatwind, uh, District of Chatwind is um, I suggest acquiring one of the BEVs or battery electric vehicles or your extended range vehicle. Um, for fleet, just to see how it goes, um, at least to go around town here and even up to Dawson Creek and the surrounding area, you'd be able to do that just fine um, for meetings. One of the, and pretty much any of the vehicles that you see on the list that I've sanded, handed out would actually do you really well as well for that. Um, I would expand your charging station network as well. So have, you know, more. It's amazing that there is one here and I would love to see just more of them blossom everywhere throughout the north. Um, also make sure that they're winterized as well because there is a difference between the summer package and the winter package um, as well. I can answer questions on that. <laughs> um, I would also invite Plug-in BC's emotive campaign and along, or along with the Community Energy Association to host uh, electric vehicle presentations. They do it for free, they're amazing. I have contacts if you would like them. Um, and they, they always have just a really great setup and brochures and information. So if any of uh, your staff or the public are interested in it, they have, yeah everything for that. Um, and then also have brochures and info sheets that you can find on the Plugin BC website at, the, at your office here as well, so that if people come in with questions, then you, know, you have this information as well available. Um, okay, so my last slide here. Um, is just a couple of websites that may have been of interest. Uh, I was asked to do information on fleet vehicles. I don't have a ton of that, but I did find some really great sources for it. So um, I know there's been staff members working on it. So if they haven't come across this, I strongly recommend to go check out these sites because they break down all of your cost analysis, fuel, all that kind of stuff for it. So it's really handy. And that is me. Any questions? Questions for Jennifer? Go ahead, Laura. Just confirmation. Do we actually have a charging station? I thought we did here. I saw a thing on it. My apologize. I don't believe that we do, uh, unless there's a new one. Well, one of the map websites says you do, so we'll be fixing that shortly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Karen Creek. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So your map is right? Mm -hmm. Well, kind semi. of right. Semi. Semi right. <laughs> uh, the winterization now. Uh, just a little bit of information from uh, from us on myself and uh, staff that the carbon footprint is a very big part of everybody's uh, agenda. So this is where we sit as a, as a community 
that we need to get involved with something like that. We do a fairly good job right now of uh, carbon footprinting. We try to do everything that we can to help. And if we can and manage to do something in the future uh, with, with the fleet trucks, so that meaning our staff and, uh, and our workers out there that do hit the ground and do move stuff in regular vehicles, that would be kind of a plus to us and we wouldn't be using uh, fossil fuels for that. This is uh, why we need to have information given to us so that we can go out and find these uh, opportunities. Uh, any more questions for Jennifer? Yes, go ahead. I don't know if it's more of a question, but there's been a couple of things. We actually voted on uh, not putting a, uh, a charger in town because of the cost to the, uh, to the community. We're, we're, and I, if I'm not mistaken, we voted on it last council meeting. And the fact that we shouldn't be in business, uh, like we, we aren't opening in a, a gas station or, um, or a compressed gas station for um, the people who burn natural gas and so on. I don't think we should be in business uh, of doing that. Now, if, and the fleet trucks, I also j suggested uh, several months ago that we should be going to Ford or going to this other company and get them to donate a couple of trucks so that we can actually do a beta test and see how these vehicles would perform in, in our climate. Uh, there, there's, some, there's some skepticism around as to how they would perform when it's 40 below. Um, okay, so first point on uh, business, uh, I totally understand uh, that, um, but by about 2040, no more um, internal combustion engines vehicles will be on the market for sale, so we should, at least in my opinion, start moving towards that direction. Um, also having electric vehicle charging stations in town here will actually help with tourism as well you have more and more people from the south going and doing electric vehicle tourism throughout the province because more people down south want to travel with their electric vehicles and can't actually get that far unless they have charging stations so if you stick a larger level two charging station in Chetwin, for instance, they have to hang out here for five hours, which is good for your town. Um, and then, as for vehicles not running well in minus 40, um, they actually run really great. It's the fact that your range is gonna go down a little bit due to the trying to heat the inside of the vehicle, but there is becoming more and more winterized packages where you can actually keep your electric vehicle plugged in um, while it's warming up, and then you keep that heat for the time being. Um, you'll probably still lose some range because you have to heat the windshield and everything like that, but if you get an extended range electric vehicle, the internal combustion engine that is inside of it, um, as a backup generator to your electric one should actually provide enough heat to help with your interior heating along with the windshield. Um, and you don't actually need to plug in an electric vehicle in minus 40. They actually turn on just like that. So it, it, It's not the, the concept of the electrical, electric vehicle that I'm personally opposed to. It's the it's the concept of the government getting into the business of supplying chargers and so on. That should be a private private sector initiative, in my personal opinion only. And uh, the vehicles themselves, how long they last with the batteries when it's 40 below. I'm not, I, I'm assuming the performance is gonna be fine. It's just how long it's gonna last. I'm, I'm not opposed to any of it. I'm just opposed to the, the government investing in, in uh, what should be a private sector uh, issue. Fair enough. Um, we can go back and forth all day, but uh, if you would like, I do have, I don't have it with me, but I can send you a copy of my thesis. Um, there is, which is the 60 page one, I will come out with a shorter one eventually here, um, but 
in regards to government being involved, it's kind of the chicken and egg situation. Um, private industry is not going to most likely move forward on this technology, which is new um, or newer than without incentive. And they're not going to incentivize unless people are actually interested in going towards it. And they're not, people aren't gonna go towards it unless, you know, range anxiety, which is the fear of running out of electricity um, is diminished. And the only way you can do that is to have charging stations in your communities. There is though, non for profits that are working on this. So the Community Energy Association that I mentioned earlier, they have Charge North. That's going from Prince George out to Kitimat, but I think they are expanding into the northeastern part of the province once that stage is done. Um, Mackenzie declined, so that kind of chopped off at that end, but hopefully it'll go further. So I hear what you're saying when it comes to government, um, but I think if you want this to actually be a thing, you're gonna have to put some effort into it. It, it, it's not as much government, it's, it's the local taxpayers that have to fund part of it. Like, it's not a free and clear grant. Like if we were to get a free 100% grant to put in a charging station, I'm sure we'd be, we, we'd be up, and had, uh, up, up for it. But um, for the taxpayers to fund that, I, I, I don't think it's fair. Okay. I will come back to you on that, sir. All right, any other questions? None? Good. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, I really appreciate you guys having me here today. I don't see any bylaws. Carry on with our meeting. Any committee reports? Actually, I have, um, I, I can give you a report for my week in Prince George. Please do. Okay. Um, actually, I was, we were, me, myself, the mayor, and Alan were in um, BC Resource Forum this week, and actually, it was, it was probably one of the better ones that I've attended. Um, the, one, the first workshop that me and Alan attended was um, the communication crisis workshop, and I think it's um, it's really important that we get to know our that we have a communication a crisis communication plan. I, I know we do, but the way they talked is really important. The mayor and council are aware of it, and we know what happens um, if we have a crisis. Hopefully, we don't have to worry about it as a fire or something like that. But they also have training available which I think is important for the media to, de to deal with the media in a crisis. I, I know our mayor is our spokesperson, but if, something, if the mayor is tied up or training even for our mayor, how to deal with the media in crisis, because we don't, can't give out false information or false hope, something that we should think about. Um, the next morning we had the minister's breakfast. Um, they really didn't talk about a lot of new things except for the undrip which is Bill 41, um, it's kind of new, they just signed it, it's United Nations of, on the right of an indig indigenous people. So they mainly talked about it, um, so anybody that's interested in that should go to the website and take a look at it. Um, the keynote speaker for the lunch was um, Premier Horgan. Um, he too didn't really talk about a lot except for Bill 41 and the approving the new pl or the pipeline that's going through and that it's a go ahead. The rally was just before him from the LNG people, and that was great. There was probably about 40 or 50 people that showed up to rally in front of the building. They did a really good job. Um, Thursday we had um, a really, actually one of the panels was really interesting. It was, um, it was called Fresh Perspectives from Tomorrow's Leaders, which was a group of young people, and they talked mainly about climate change. Um, they didn't go quite as radical as um, Greta does. They're, they're quite rational. They were talking about knowing that they need their laptops, knowing that they need their cell phones, knowing that they need all that energy and everything that has to. So they need to work with these companies. And yes, we can't get rid of our oil and gas. We can't get rid of all of our energy. Um, but the keynote speaker at the lunch was probably one of the best speakers I've ever heard. Um, her, name, her name is Crystal Smith. 
She is the um, chief of the Heisla Nation. She's taken over for Alice Ross, who used to be the chief. And I don't know if anyone's heard Alice Ross speak, but he's incredible. She was actually just as good. She talked about how she came up out of poverty in her band in her First Nation and how they signed on to the agreement with the pipeline with Coastal Gas Link and she was and the reasons they signed on um, to better their nation and it was just really um, really heartwarming and it was you could have heard a pin drop in that when she was talking it was incredible um, what else do they talk about and then a couple of the besides besides the sessions which went all week um, the networking was really incredible this year we had opportunities to speak to all of the ministers. We um, actually, I think our mayor even accosted the premier in the hotel. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure he'll share that with you. Um, we actually had a chance to sit down, myself and the mayor, with TransCanada um, Energy to talk about the Coastal Gas Link. And um, they're going to bring us up to date on some. Apparently, the camp that's at six kilometer on the highway is not going to be going in because of the frogs and it's too wet so environmental reasons they can't go there so I'm understanding that they're partnering with one of the First Nations to be put on their land but I'm not 100% sure on that but they are going to come and update us on that and then of course we talked to some of the the stuff about it and about the benefits that Chetwin are hoping to see from this because they happen to be going right by us BC Hydro also mentioned that Speaking of electric vehicles, um, they have an electric vehicle station project on the go right now where they're looking at putting um, stations, I think they're putting some in Prince George right now, and they're looking at coming further north, but it won't be probably till next year, maybe the year after, they're just doing a starter thing. So that's something that BC Hydro can maybe look at doing instead of us. And BC Forest Council was there, they're, they're looking at giving out more bursaries this year, so Alan's sharing that with the high schools. Um, one of the people I sat with at the banquet was the owner of Paper Excellence. Um, we had a little discussion. It was a little bit of a language barrier because he's Chinese and I really heavy accent. I did ask him if they're looking at maybe opening up again. He, I kind of got the impression no. But um, he went into the expense of the type of wood that they needed and that heard their buyer of the product they were making fell through, so they were left holding the bag. And yeah, so he kind of went in and tried to talk about the two different types of woods, which kind of went right over my head because I wasn't understanding what he was talking about. But so anyways, um, other than that, we talked to Mr. Pewter about the project that he's looking at doing still and continue on with. Hopefully that materializes, but um, it was a great week. Um, and other than that, just some of the updates you wanted us to do on our committees that we have. Um, Sereris Place is holding their fundraiser this Saturday at the Legion Hall, $40 a ticket. Some of the donations that they have are fantastic, so I hope the whole community come out and support them. Um, myself and Alan are working on a grant for the Pine Valley Seniors where they're looking at getting an NDIT grant to redo their kitchen to help them, um, well help their building so they'll have, improve their rentals. And the Chamber of Commerce is looking at their trade show, um, it's in full swing, their, um, Naomi's working hard to get Nick going and I think she's planning on coming maybe in next month to do an update on the Chamber of Commerce. And that's that. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. That's uh, very, much, very, very good information. And uh, when we go to these conferences, there's uh, one of the things she spoke of, uh, the, the lady, I'd say young lady because uh, I was about 20 years older than her. Uh, she, uh, it was Alcan in Kitimat where the Heisla started and they looked at their uh, nation. They were, they called it uh, managing poverty and she spoke very, very uh, calmly about that until she got to the part of moving forward and Ellis Ross uh, moving that way. And he, he talked the same way when I uh, was at a conference last year about moving forward. And uh, the LNG being a big pro project and it needed to go through because we wanted to manage uh, prosperity rather than poverty. 
and they talk like that, and which is good for everybody. It's not just good for nations. It's it's good for us. It's good for uh, the nations that uh, everybody join in and uh, and uh, look that way. So it was Alcan. Now it's Rio Tinto, and it was a l a aluminum smelter, and all the jobs that it put out. So it was very very touching. And uh, when she spoke of her grandmother, and one of the things that uh, was uh, mentioned to me was uh, the grandmother thing. Uh, that young people were being brought up by their grandmothers at that age. I think she was about 45. I, I don't want to give her an age, but somewhere in that range. And we talk about the schools, the schools that were, uh, they were taken, and uh, the abuse that uh, some of them went through. And they couldn't handle their children when they did have children. That's why the grandparents stepped in, in most cases. And they were sheltered from the other stuff. So that, that was very important for, for myself to look at in the timeline. And the timeline was quite, quite, quite important to me because my dad did go to a residential school and my, uh, my auntie. And, and it wasn't my dad that talked about it. It was my auntie. So I, I get what she was talking about when she says uh, about the grandmother and stuff like that. And uh, talking to, uh, go back a little bit about Horgan. I met him, I didn't, we didn't get an audience with him. He didn't uh, want to meet with us. I say he didn't want to, because that's my opinion. And he didn't want to meet with the PRRD. He didn't want to meet with the representatives from Chetland, because I did put in a request. And he says, oh, we'd like to talk to all the people that went to the workshops, and uh, that's another, uh, point that I uh, would ha uh, would like to say about everything that was going on with this caribou, and we stepped back saying, I had some advice a year ago when I did uh, start on this uh, Southern Mountain Caribou Partnership Agreement that we it was going sideways, and we should step back and step out of it. Maybe that's uh, hindsight that we should have done then, what we're doing now, because it's very important that we show as a, a group that we are together and we should stand together as a community, not just because we are here in Chetwin, because it's surrounding area. West Moberly, Soto, Flats, right? Both of them out here, Asler, Jackfish, East Pine, all the areas, jackfish, we, we all live here. And that will, that's one of the things that we wanted to make a point that is that we, we would like the voice. We've been always striving to get that voice in the partnership agreement. And the letter, January 16th from Premier Horgan, we will not change any text in this agreement. So we were told, we were told, and then we were told. No, you aren't going to be part of this agreement. It is, we thought, initial, and then when I talked to him, as Laura indicated in her uh, report about the uh, uh, costing who, right? So I talked to him. In, inside the coast in lobby, he was coming in because he had a great, uh, he, w he just signed an agreement with uh, seven nations on the, Northwest, we're in the Northeast, we got it, and now they're getting it. So uh, one of the things that was very prevalent with my discussion with him, he said signed agreement. And I says, I have an understanding that it was initialed by my, by my partners in this agreement, Roland, Ken, and the federal government would say that we had a signed agreement and we, I cannot get in there and change it. But in our partnership agreement, he has that ability. That's what we were trying to stress and we would like to be there. If they would have done it properly, do all the uh, socioeconomic studies, get that done, see where we're at prior to talking. And yet, nothing. We, we got it, we're getting it, and hopefully it doesn't disturb most of us at what we do in Chetwin and surrounding area. We were very positive with Blair 
and he resigned the other day. So with that, I believe the calming of the waters was Blair Laxton, and I would like to say thank you to Blair Laxton from the council, from the mayor, for taking on the initiative of that. And I would say that would have been a tough task, and now I know it was a tough task, because he's sitting there the same as us, didn't have no say in our uh, community and surrounding area. I will not talk uh, about the PRRD. I will let the PRRD talk for themselves because they have their own initiatives because they are much bigger than uh, what we have here in Chetwin. I only talk sometimes just to the boundaries of Chetwin. But I do have a heart for the whole community and when I mean community, I hold a in my heart, the surrounding areas, and that's a big part of Chetwin, and it's always been a big part of Chetwin. So when the agreement uh, comes uh, past us and we say yes, we, we might and we shall get involved for the citizens of Chetwin. Prior to that, when it goes to the legislature in, in uh, Victoria, we will not attend any of those uh, working groups because, as in my letter, stating that we don't want to be classified as saying that we agree with this agreement. So that's my point, and uh, I have a letter that was sent out, if you're not uh, familiar with it. It's in our uh, agenda here, and it's one of the cor correspondence. You can read it in the correspondence. So with that, uh, I would like to say that we shall move on from from our reports, I guess. I guess that's the mayor's report, I guess, on the side. Thank you, Laurie, for yours. And uh, is there any other reports? Okay, we're good with that. The information item, C2. Uh, Just accept. Motion to receive. Thank you. Okay, uh, information items done. Report for actions, RA1, Zoning Amendment, 53rd place, <coughs> Northwest. Okay, okay. Okay, I need a uh, question for correspondence. I have nothing to pull. Anybody, anything pulling? from the correspondence? Okay, so, set. Motion to receive item C1 to C8. Thank you very much. Second. Any more discussion? We're good. All those in favor, thank you. And we did information. Good, okay, let's go to the reports for action. RA1 zoning amendment, 53rd, Place Northwest. I would make that motion that the zoning amendment bylaw number 1107 2020 4701 53rd Place Northwest be introduced and given the first and second reading, and that a public hearing be scheduled to obtain a public input on zoning amendment bylaw number 1107 2020 on February 18th, 2020 at 4 p.m. Second. Any discussion? Sure. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Carried. RA2, uh, North Central Local Government Association 2020 resolutions, or resolution. I can make that recommendation that council authorize the resolution included with this report as attachment A and that a resolution be forwarded on to the North Central Local Government Association before the friendly deadline of February the 21st. Seconds? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Carried. 
RA3 2020 equipment purchase. Is any electric vehicles on the list? Mm -hmm. I'll make a recommendation to authorize the council authorize the purchase of 2019 GMC Sierra 2500 4x4 pickup and that the financial plan be amended to include the purchase of the above mentioned truck for 40,511.88. Second. Okay. Any discussion? No, this was in our budget already, right? Yep. Yeah, so no. Okay, good. All those in favor? Okay, good. Ports for information, good. I don't see any business. No new business. Any questions from the public on anything that we discussed today? Not seeing any. Any reporters here? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Adjournment? So moved. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Chris. They slapped on the cuffs And jail time was their bluff I walked away with a $500 fine Cause it was only two grammars Not enough dope for the slammer So I kept on cruising down the line Sue St. Marie, look what you've done to me Such a shame that we had to meet this way and I guess I learned my lesson, I suppose I'll count my blessings, but it's safe to say I won't be back again. And when I left the border, my fuse was getting shorter, I went back to the Canadian side of town, hoping things would get better, but the streets were getting wetter, and the Sioux kept on dragging me down. And on Wellington and Bruce, that's where all hell So a loop segment is actually a pipeline that will be built parallel to an existing right-of-way pipeline and then it connects back into the system. So in, in essence, it forms a loop.